I'm Tim Davis from the Primary Markets team at the London Stock Exchange. I'm delighted to welcome you today to the next instalment of our Be Inspired series. Be Inspired is about talking to business leaders and chief executives about how they've got to where they are, about their businesses, also about the public markets and what they look to uh, for the public markets in support of their businesses. I'm delighted today to be joined by Sarah Howell, CEO of Cambridge-based Aricor Therapeutics. Aricor joined our AIM market in June of this year, having raised £20 million and started life with a market capitalisation of £62 million. Sarah, a very warm welcome. Thank you. Nice to see you, Tim. And you. So before we get down to business, let's talk a bit about you, the person. So what made you want to become a scientist? Wow, I mean, that's going back a long way. I think, you know, from quite a, a young age, I wanted to be a scientist. And, and you know, that initially was influenced by um, actually my mum, really. She's not a scientist herself, but had a love of um, crime drama. So I was always an avid reader and would read anything and everything that was available. So there was a lot of crime books around the house. So, you know, at that time, I became pretty convinced that I wanted to be a forensic scientist and um, you know really looked into that and thought about that a lot more but then when I was choosing my A-levels and degree decided not to specialise at that stage that I could do that later still convinced I was going to become a, a forensic scientist but then followed a, an academic path in chemistry and it was really during my PhD then when I was working on these self-replicating systems new medicines that um, you know, I really fell in love with pharma, really, and this idea of being a part of bringing, able to, bringing medicines and treatments to patients, really. And, uh, yeah, that was the, the start of my career, really. Yeah. When you're not doing that, outside of work, what do you like to do? What's your downtime? How do you switch off? Well, down, yeah, downtime, whether it's downtime or not, uh, you know, perception there. But I've got three boys, so um, I spend a lot of time outside with them. I'm an outdoor person, so that suits me well. And, you know, if I'm not spending time with them or my family, then, you know, road cycling really is my sort of passion. I love to jump on my bike and get out. I'm fortunate where I live, you know, I can get out into the country lanes pretty easily. And it's just a great way. Keeping fit and healthy, you know, helps me with sort of energy levels as well and it, it's also a good way of clearing your head so uh, I get on my bike as much as I can. And if you had a guilty or if you have a guilty pleasure what is it or if you haven't what would it be? Ooh, giving away my secrets now Tim <laughs> um, you know and I think you know said you know lots of time outside running a business it's pretty hectic so you know if I get the chance and um, sometimes there's nothing better than a nice glass of red wine curling up on the sofa and watching something on Netflix, to be honest. It just feels like such an indulgence to be able to do that. I watched the, the Queen's Gambit recently and really enjoyed that. So I'm on the lookout for recommendations. So here we are. Now, imagine there are non-scientists. You meet someone who's a non-scientist. How yeah. do you explain in a minute or two what Aricor does in plain English for non-scientists? OK, yeah, I mean, you know, for Aracor, you know, our kind of vision and purpose is very much around um, transforming patient care and improving patient outcomes. And we do this by applying a proprietary, so owned by us, formulation technology platform. So we're enhancing um, existing therapeutic products. So to give an example of that, you know, we are taking an insulin. It's been around for decades. And we're using our technology to develop very fast acting versions of insulin. And this helps people with diabetes better manage their blood glucose and ultimately then improve their outcomes. And so again, focused on that, transforming that patient care and outcomes. We also partner them with leading pharmaceutical and biotech companies to enhance their products under a technology licensing model, again, focused at improving and differentiating those so that they can improve patient care and outcomes. And given, given what you just said, is there a particular business mentor that you have in mind in terms of people you follow or people you, you have the ability to ask questions directly to? Yeah, I'd say I don't have a, a kind of single go-to person as a mentor, but a network of mm -hmm. people outside of Aracor who I can go to for support and advice. And I think that's 
really key, really, because as a CEO, you know, everyone's looking to you. You're setting the vision and purpose and you're driving that energy and moving everything forward. So so who do you look to when you, you want a piece of advice there? Because everyone thinks you have all the answers all the time and you know we're all human so I think that's really important and you know so I have a network of people both friends and professionally I can go to to talk to when I need that support you know the Aracle board is a, a great example of a support network you know they're there to support but also challenge and there's healthy challenge there but they have great um, sector and industry expertise between them you know if I was to call a person out individually I'd call out Andy Richards you know I've known Andy now for a long time and he you know, he was the had the belief in me to take over as CEO of Aracor, and I think he's a great supporter of life sciences in the, the UK. And, and again, great person to go to for, for advice. What do you find are the key challenges of being a CEO of a public company? Yeah, I mean, I think I, as I kind of touched on there, you know, as the CEO, you're responsible for setting that vision and purpose of the company and really energizing the whole organization behind that. And that takes a huge amount of, you know, personal energy and drive. So as a CEO, you're always giving your energy, your skills, your full dedication to the to the company and that comes with significant internal external pressures you know everybody's looking at you so i think as we've spoken about that support network is key otherwise being a ceo can be quite a lonely place to be and and you know and, and the backdrop to that as well is that people are completely critical to the success of any organization any business so ensuring as you grow and you know aracor is a high growth business here and you know we're adding people into the mix getting that culture right within the organization so you can grow with that culture is key and it's not easy you know that's a real challenge that you've got to really give that the time and attention it needs and, and keep your eye on the ball um there and i think you know as you said i recall very recently a public company I think um, that comes with its challenges and opportunities as well you know now every key decision that we make um, every result needs to be communicated to the market and, and quickly and the market will ultimately then make decisions essential on whether to buy or sell shares in the company so you know that brings with its own unique set of, of challenges but also you know opportunities there. What were the drivers for taking Aracor public? Yeah, I mean, I think for me, it was always in on the pathway there that at the right time going public would be the right thing to do for Aracor as we grow. And it's it's really about growth. You know, this is, you know, view to our, you know, our purpose here is to bring products to market that can improve patient outcomes and to grow a large and sustainable business. And I think that's where that's where you've got to look to the public markets and say, okay, this is a growth story. The best place to be ultimately then is on the public markets. And we made the decision um, relatively recently, actually, to go for the, the AIM IPO. It was at the, you know, earlier this year. And, you know, partly that was a window of opportunity, I think, on the COVID backdrop. It was clear that, you know, the public markets, particularly London, and there are investors there looking for good quality healthcare and life sciences companies. And, you know, we felt that we were in a good position there and had ambitious growth plans moving forward. So those, those two things really came forward and we made the decision quite quickly to move forward um, with a AIM IPO. And, and thankfully, as you said, it was, it was very successful um, there. You know, we had an oversubscribed 20 million raise. So I think it was the right decision to make, but it, it's all about growth. And uh, looking back on the whole IPO process, what did you learn from it? Yeah, it's funny, you know, I, I went to, as many people will do, I'm sure, that are thinking about it, even if they're thinking about it two, three years down the, the road, they'll start coming to various sessions and workshops on what do you need to do to IPO? And in reality, until you actually do it, you, you can't really understand what that means. You can go theoretically through the process. And, you know, through all of these, you know, workshops that I went to, the, the kind of overriding message was, it will be hell. You know, you will have whatever, four to six months of, it will be a nightmare. And, and then hopefully you'll IPO at the end of it. And, 
So for me, the surprise, and it's a pleasant surprise, was it was nowhere near as bad as I thought it was going to be. You know, so, you know, maybe those part of those workshops is to set you up to think this is as bad as it could be and then uh, it can exceed your expectations. But, you know, I think for me, it was the right decision to, to, to make and we, we really went for it. And it, it wasn't the nightmare process I thought it was going to be. And in terms of any other fundraising, so private rounds, let's say, that you've been involved in, how did it differ? More complex, maybe? Um, in a sense, it's, it's more condensed. You know, there's obviously, you know, a lot of elements that you need to do for a, a public raise, you know, verification, you know, all of these things, if your prospectuses and admission documents and things that you don't need to do for a private raise. But having said that, it's condensed, but there's a very defined process to go through and there's a there's a defined endpoint and you know with a, a private raise you know private raises can go on for a long time so it it may be not as intense at any moment in time but you can get into perpetual due diligence quite easily on a private raise so you know in a sense I think that that condensed and having an endpoint for me personally I'm a bit of a crammer I always have been I like to you know, be under pressure and, um, you know, perhaps suited my personality as well. But at least, you know, you can plan your business around it because you're either going to get the IPO away, raise the capital that you're looking for and get on with the business or not within quite a short period of time. So a business and an IPO to run simultaneously. How did you manage that? Yeah, I mean, I think when we look at the IPO, you know, certainly myself and Susan Lauber, who's our CFO, were fully focused on the IPO definitely for a four month period that was completely absorbing for us and all encompassing. And so then running the business really comes down to the team, the management team and the leadership team outside of um, Susan and I in this case. And, you know, they did a fantastic job at keeping the wheels on, quite frankly, and delivering. And I think we can see that now, you know, post the IPO, we've been hitting our major milestones and, and value drivers which is really important and that's really testament to that team you know taking the business and effectively running it and delivering without you know input from Susan and I so you've got to have that strength and depth in your team I think going towards an IPO if you don't want to see the business slow down in parallel. And earlier on we, we touched on non-executive directors did they play a full part in the IPO process? Yeah, I mean, definitely. So, you know, across our board, again, you know, we have that group that's there's a healthy challenge there and also, you know, sector expertise and public market expertise. So I think, that, again, they're a great sounding board um, as we're going through that process in terms of the messaging, the growth story, what are we looking to achieve here? And, you know, we're really hands on. So that was really valuable to us as well through that process. When you're doing your fundraising round, um, we've heard reference of the um, halo effect of COVID in terms of people, not least of all investors, suddenly developing an interest in, in this scenario, UK science and healthcare, and getting behind it, putting the money where their mouth is. Did you find that when you were doing the rounds of potential investors? Yeah, definitely. I think, you know, as we talked about, there was that window of opportunity as well that we felt that, um, you know, looking for good quality life science and healthcare companies there. And I think partly, you know, what we saw and still seeing, you know, through the pandemic was the resilience of the life science industry as well, being able to continue to move forward and also the value that it brings. I think, you know, for anybody in a life science company, you're really looking at, you know, your purpose here is about improving lives ultimately one way or another. And I think that really resonates with the investors as well, with the addition of these are resilient businesses, actually, that can bring value to the table, which also, you know, we can all feel good about that value too. So several months on, what are your reflections on running a public company and running a business simultaneously? How much, yeah. how much time does each take up? <laughs> yeah, I mean, at the moment, I, you know, on the time aspect, obviously, we um, IPO'd at the beginning of June and then very swiftly went into our half year results. So our interim results is because we run a, a calendar year. So, 
you know, I would say since June with the IPO and getting to know our new investors and also then running straight into our interims, you know, the majority of the time has been externally sort of facing sort of markets, investors, et cetera. But I think that will start to average out a little bit more now and there'll be, you know, a, a healthy split, I think, between sort of hands on, you know, vision, running the business, energizing and, you know, the external market. But to be honest, those two things need to come hand in hand anyway. You know, you know, we need to deliver as a business. You know, we've we've made promises there of what we're going to deliver and we will deliver those things. And also, you know, we um, as any bit growth business, it's about that capital as well to enable us to move forward and grow. What advice would you give to your fellow CEOs who may be contemplating IPO? I mean, I think the main thing to start with is to, um, to focus on and be clear on why you're doing it. I mean, I, you know, from my perspective, an IPO is very much the next stage in a growth story. It's not an exit. So you've got to be clear on why you're doing it and what you're looking to achieve from that. And I think if you can tick those boxes that we have ambition here to grow, you know, we we have a good growth story and, and value drivers and milestones that we can reach moving forward. And you've got the, you know, the energy and the drive to do it, then I, I would say, you know, go for it and actually seize the opportunity that if you want to do it quite quickly as we did, it can be done if you've got the right team in place that can run the business and you know you've got the right focus you can you can move forward quite quickly so where next yeah well that's a big question as well so you know i think Farrakor, as we've touched on you know through this chat really that you know our kind of vision and purposes around you know transforming patient care so you know what we all want to see in the organization is our products on the market, products that are enabled and differentiated using our technology. That's both with our partners and also products we're taking forward in diabetes care, for example. And I think by doing that and delivering on that, really what follows from that is that you're able to then grow a large and sustainable um, business. So that's really the aim for us to move forward, to deliver on our portfolio, to see these products on the market and following from that, seeing the, the business grow and become sustainable. Sarah Howell, Chief Executive of Aracor Therapeutics, thank you very much indeed for your time today. To see more of our Be Inspired series, please join us on Spark Live London Stock Exchange's Digital Hub, where you'll find not only series of interviews, but also a whole range of other thought provoking and hopefully inspiring uh, material brought to you by our issuers, by our marketplace companies, and also by our other supporters. Mm -hmm.